You can't assume that that is this exact same exposure as a population. A completely different dietary pattern in a population with a higher background risk. It's important that we think about all of these things and don't try to come to kind of overly general and simplistic conclusions if they're not available for us to do so. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Howdy, friends. Glad to be back here together again. I hope that you've been keeping well. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today, I sit down with Dr. Alan Flanagan to tackle the mighty topic of dairy foods and human health. Now, you might be thinking, why on earth is Simon chatting about dairy? Well, here's why. Just a quick browse of social media, best-selling books, and mainstream media headlines will likely leave one very confused about dairy. I don't know about you, but I think it's interesting to explore. Is dairy really inflammatory? Does it increase the risk of cancer? Is dairy protective for cardiovascular disease, or does it negatively affect blood cholesterol? Is dairy good for our gut bugs? Despite the clear environmental impact and animal welfare issues attached to dairy production, which are, of course, tremendously important issues, I think we should be able to ponder the answers to these questions through an objective, scientific lens. Personally, I don't consume dairy, and nothing in this episode made me want to change that, but it did confirm what I thought, that when it comes to dairy and our health, it's certainly a misunderstood food group. So with that, I invite you to bring an open mind and come with me on this objective exploration of all things dairy. This is me and Dr. Alan Flanagan. Please enjoy. Alan Flanagan, take two. Welcome back, mate. It's uh, been a little while since we last caught up, but great to have you back. Yeah, it's great to be back, mate. And uh, yeah, I think in take one, we were discussing kind of the, you know, seven country study and how myths don't (laughs) die in nutrition. (laughs) So here we still are. I think some folks listening might be thinking, why is Simon dedicating an episode to dairy? (laughs) He doesn't consume it. What are we doing? Um, so maybe I can I can kind of give a bit of background on that. Uh, from from my point of view, the the reason that I wanted to to do this episode with you was more general intrigue with regards to the polarity among the views held mm. by those uh, those online and in the mainstream media about dairy and, and whether it's healthy or not. You know, for example, the likes of Neil Barnard and Michael Greger, Mark Hyman, uh, Caldwell Esselstyn. Yeah. And also several people in the paleo community who take the position that an optimal diet for everyone is dairy free. It must be dairy free. Mm -hmm. And then there are other folks like, for example, the Sonnenbergs who I've had on this show who do research on the microbiome um, and and, uh, Mario Kratz, for example, Mm -hmm. who take the position that dairy at least specific types can be can actually be health promoting and there's a lot of different sort of specific claims within these positions for example uh, dairy is inflammatory that's one that you'll see quite a lot Uh, dairy causes cancer Mm -hmm. dairy is bad for bone health dairy is good for bone health Uh, dairy is beneficial for the microbiome etc etc and I recently did an episode, I'm not sure if you saw it, that reminded me of all this confusion. It was an episode with a biochemist called Jared Raines who is working for a company that's producing animal-free dairy proteins via uh, precision fermentation. And I was interested in that because I'm also acutely aware of growing population and and need to produce enough protein sustainably. and, And I thought it was worth having that conversation and sort of understanding this new area of food. So having received a bunch of questions from people after that episode about dairy, I thought let's get Alan on and and just be- better understand what the science says about dairy. And then we can sort of perhaps make sense of why there are a lot of different views out there. 
Is it because the science is unclear? Is it because of industry funded science? Is it because it's a very heterogeneous food group? Is it because of the way it's produced and, and the way it affects animals and, and that's affecting how people interpret the evidence and, and so on. So perhaps to kind of kick things off, mm. what is it about dairy that firstly sort of makes this an interesting food group to discuss and study? I think it's the diversity of it. Um, and so I think I think that there's 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 really you know, this, this is not, we use the term dairy, right? Uh, but this is an umbrella term for a really heterogeneous food group, right? It's, it's, there's multiple, uh, levels upon which we could make distinctions in this, within this food group. So we could make distinctions along whether it's fermented or not. We could make distinctions based on its uh, dietary fat content. We could make distinctions based on whether it's refined like butter or unrefined and fermented like something like cheese or yogurt. We could make a distinction whether it's conf- a solid or a liquid, milk or again, you know, a, a cheese or yogurt. So it's at the level of the food group, we t- we typically just use this term dairy, um, but that's not really sufficiently granular for us to explore the associated health effects of this really broad food group. Um, and so there, there, there literally is no one universal conclusion that anyone could come to in relation to, quote, dairy – as a food group, like there is no conclusion anyone can reach about that term because that term is too unspecific um, to to discuss the kind of health implications. And when we think about its role in in the diet, uh, there's any number of background factors that are also relevant in terms of wider populations that consume it, the background diet of that population. Um, their habitual adaptation to dairy, although there's even evidence of that changing. If you look at countries like China, for example, they have significantly more overall dairy consumption than they would have 20 years ago. Um, but there are there are a lot of background population factors um, that go into its consumption, the magnitude of its consumption and otherwise. So if we're setting aside, which is important, the environmental or even moral and ethical considerations, which which I, I appreciate for your audience is likely, a, and each of those or any number of them together is likely a really important factor in their sure. determining their dietary decisions. And that's absolutely an important conversation. But we should be able to have distinct conversations about these. And I think what's happened in recent years is we've really blurred the lines between being able to have a conversation purely at the level of the nutrition kind of side of it mm-hmm. and contribution to health or otherwise um, versus then saying, well, there are these kind of environmental, ethical or other considerations, which are really important. But what is kind of happening now is people are reverse engineering from the environmental, moral and ethical place to then color their view of the research. So they're incapable sure. because of the stance they take in relation to those other issues to actually have a reasoned or objective interpretation of the of the research side. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I really want to bring to folks' attention is that it's okay to opt out of a food, but at the same time, objectively review the literature and objectively communicate what the evidence shows from a human health point of view. Exactly. And I tried to do that in my book and I, and I have had some some good feedback from people. So I think people do appreciate that when you are able to go into to some of the, the nuance. Um, do you, that point that you made about the, the sort of umbrella term of dairy being unspecific, mm. that actually gets me thinking about other food groups and even if we thought about, say, fruit, Yes. Uh, For example, a mango is very different to an avocado. So is this something that exists uh, across nutrition? 
I, I think yes, generally speaking. Um, although, you know, depending on the food group, there might be kind of more homogeneity. Like if we think of, say, beans and legumes, for example, although they may differ sure. in subtle ways, if you look at their macronutrient composition, you know, they might differ a little bit in fiber, but kind of overall their fiber content similar. You know, they might differ in protein content and quality, but overall, you know, it's kind of simple. And so you do get some food groups that might have a degree of more consistency in terms of the kind of nutrition that you would derive from that food group. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think fruit's a good example of that. I think, you know, obviously vegetables are a good example of that mm. in terms of diversity and related nutrient content, um, particularly as it relates to other interesting non-nutritive compounds like polyphenols. Mm. Why do you think that we just tend to sort of lump, you know, so many foods under one umbrella? Is it, is it just uh, because performing these observational studies, it makes it easier from a data analysis point of view? I think there's probably that. I think if you look at the evolution of a lot of, you know, nutritional epidemiology, it's typically come from starting at a much broader definition and then someone comes along and goes, well, hold on a minute. Actually, this study looked at total dairy intake, for example, but mm. maybe there's a difference between low fat dairy consumption and, and whole milk or full fat dairy consumption. Uh, so let's look at that. Or maybe there's a difference between fermented and unfermented. Let's look at that. Maybe there's a difference if we're thinking at the level of nutrients. Maybe, you know, there's a difference. Okay, so, you know, the epidemiology early in the 19 kind of 60s and 70s is like, well, looking total saturated fat. And then you might get someone saying, well, actually, what if the saturated fat in red meat is more associated with risk than the saturated fat in, uh, you know, yogurt, for example? So over time, I think that's just science doing its work. Over time, you get this kind of, you know, evolution. Um, and again, this is not a, a thing that, uh, an observation that's unique even to dairy. Like we've seen it happen with um, other food groups as well. We've seen it happen with um, fruit, for example, where you have, say, overall fruit consumption. If you look at some of the neurodegenerative disease epidemiology, you know, overall fruit consumption wasn't particularly convincing, you know, and it's not exactly that fruit's an unhealthy food group. And then you've got other researchers come along and be like, well, actually some fruits much richer in flavonoids and other polyphenol contents. Mm -hmm. What if we look at differences between type of fruit? And of course, then you see that some fruits were not necessarily strongly associated, but other fruits like dark pigmented berries and citrus fruits more consistently associated. So I think that's just science doing its thing and evolving over time in terms of the types of questions researchers are asking until we get to a point where we're kind of at now where we have an understanding of a lot of nuance in the in the evidence base. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Right. Yeah, we 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 can get a bit more granular over time. I'm I'm after a sound bite here before we jump into things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I know that Alan, Dr. Alan Flanagan, he's he's definitely good for a sound bite. Um, I'm interested in how accurately you believe the the research on dairy and human health is currently being portrayed on social media. Uh, I'm gonna say not at all. Um, and I'm going to say that what we're seeing in that conversation is a real, I think, um, urge to portray this food group in the most negative light possible. And that relates to all sorts of claims, whether it's to do with inflammation or otherwise. But it seems to me... Other and this is this this what I find interesting about this is as it relates to other foods of animal origin, there appears to be relative to what the actual research says a really disproportionate lobbying <laughs> against dairy specifically as as a food group. One of the things, Alan, that I see online is how can we we really be sure how dairy affects our health when so much of the literature is funded by the dairy industry? 
particularly when we know that it, that industry funded research is far more likely to find a, a neutral or positive result for the food or food group that they profit from. What are your thoughts on that if someone is thinking this? Mm. I think there's a couple of levels we can think about industry funding and it is, is important that we do think about it in any research context, biomedical, nutrition or otherwise. Um, the first is most of the epidemiology is not industry funded. You don't necessarily need industry funded to funding to look at populations. So, so the at the level of epidemiology, this isn't something that is necessarily going to be as influential as people might think. I think the second factor then is in terms of interventions, which are much more likely to be. Uh, it have ha, because they need a, a source of funding in order to experimentally carry out whatever design that they have proposed. Uh, I think it's really important to scrutinize methodology. And I think that ultimately, industry funding is something to be aware of as an amber light, but it's not an instant red light. What makes it potentially shift from amber to red is if there are some methodological factors that uh, you know are not satisfactory in a critical appraisal of that paper, like is randomization method uh, mentioned, uh, and was that method appropriate? What was the recruiting method, uh, and all these kind of really kind of more nitty gritty questions. And if a study ultimately stands up to a methodological critical appraisal then I don't think that we need to be as concerned with the source of the funding. So I think it's always something mm -hmm. that we need to consider. But the idea that in, it invalidates an entire area of research uh, is really just using that as an excuse to come to a conclusion probably someone would reach otherwise. At a high level, if we consider the kind of current evidence that exists on dairy and, and human health, outcomes and looking at how dairy affects, say, established biomarkers, uh, risk factors for disease relative to other food groups like red meat or fish or, or even fruits and vegetables, how comprehensive, how well studied is, is dairy? How comprehensive is the body of evidence looking at this relationship? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's been a mainstay food group in uh, Western populations, um, European populations. It's expanded in terms of consumption. It's also a really important food group in countries with traditionally vegetarian populations like the subcontinent. Um, so we, we have a fairly enormous <laughs> body of, of evidence um, at both the level of epidemiology and in terms of intervention trials and in terms of, you know, mechanistic research as well and understanding differential effects of fatty acids or effects on, you know, intermediate risk factors and otherwise. So, and as we kind of alluded to previously, we also have within this quite substantial body of evidence, the granularity to be able to distinguish between some of these characteristics of mm -hmm. dairy produce rather than just try and come to some all-encompassing umbrella conclusion in relation to the word dairy, which really isn't necessarily possible. So if you were going to kind of, let's say, summarize or break that down before we get into the specifics of some of these claims and where the evidence lies, let's say you're, you're out at a pub in mm -hmm. London. I know that you like mm -hmm. to do that. I do. And uh, <laughs> a mate comes up and says he, he knows nothing about nutrition but he's, he's interested in making healthy choices. And he says, Alan, I'm, I'm very confused about dairy. I see all sorts of opinions online. I'm trying to work out if I should include dairy, specific types of dairy in my diet, if there are some that I should avoid. And, and let's say for the sake of this hypothetical, he says to you, I'm, I'm going to separately look into the environmental impact and ethical uh, questions that come with the production and consumption of dairy. But he's asking you about da the specific types of dairy, how they affect health and what your advice would be to him. How would you summarize that to him and what would your kind of recommendations be? 
uh, top line, I'd say yogurt and cheese. <laughs> um, and then if 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 they drank milk, I think that there is possibly a case to make for a kind of lower fat version um, of milk overall, largely because a lot of yogurts and cheese would contain more dairy fat, but that's dairy fat that kind of behaves differently. And again, yogurt and cheese would be defined as fermented products in this context. So so that's that's kind of where I'd end up saying within the food group. And, you know, so yogurts, cheese, and and perhaps some milk, and depending on their wider diet, that would influence whether it necessarily should be something more on the kind of non-fat or low-fat variety. Um, and I'd say to, you know, like, be careful with foods like butter and definitely don't be putting it in your coffee because that's that's mm-hmm. not that's not within this category of, you know, health-promoting uh, foods. And I'd, you know, highlight that those kind of foods are you know, consistent, not just with some of the epidemiology directly looking at them, but also even wider healthy dietary patterns that we see in, say, the Blue Zones, some of the Blue Zones countries, the Mediterranean diet pattern. You know, these are the foods within this umbrella term of dairy. These are the specific foods that typically are what the consumption is reflected of in that Mm -hmm. dietary pattern. Uh, So, yeah. Okay, so as we go through some of these different claims and studies, I think it would be good for us to to along the way to to point out why cheese and yogurt may behave differently Mm -hmm. to some of the other dairy products, and and I've heard you speak about that before with regards to the matrix and Mm -hmm. um, you know how 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 that may affect some some of these um, biomarkers or risk factors differently. before we we get into that, I do have a question, and I've always wondered this, and I haven't asked anyone, so I'm, I'm not sure if you've looked into it. But do you think there would be a difference between, say, industrially produced cheese and yogurt in America today versus more local, um, traditionally produced dairy in areas of Europe, for example? I think it would really depend on what that method of production is and whether you're still getting some of the effects of culturing, um, Mm -hmm. which is something that is going to obviously influence the actual fermentation process and the outcome and the kind of alteration composition to the perhaps the fat content specifically. Um, and it would depend on, of course, like the the addition of live cultures itself as as part of that, and what survives that production process. So, I I don't know enough about the food science side of things. I think it's a really interesting question, and I'd I'd be really keen to actually get an answer from someone that maybe works in more the food mm-hmm. science side of of nutrition research to to understand whether that level of yeah kind of mass production does really fundamentally alter the process of uh culturation and fermentation yeah it's just something that i've seen i've seen passing comments i I certainly haven't seen um any solid evidence on it it's a similar one that i see when when people talk about olive oil and different sort of qualities of of olive oil but um an interesting one to maybe come back to at some time yeah so let's let's start here with cardiovascular disease uh the focus of our last episode actually what do we know about the effect of dairy or specific dairy foods on uh, biomarkers that are known to say you know, raise the risk of cardiovascular disease, like LDL cholesterol or ApoB levels, or inflammation or blood pressure, etc. Yeah, so 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 mostly, you know, from a cardiovascular perspective, the kind of the major risk factors that would have been identified in the early epidemiology were uh, body weight, um, smoking alcohol intake, blood pressure, blood cholesterol. Um, and, and, and kind of rather than revise that whole period uh, again, as we did with the previous episode, I think just as a kind of synopsis of where we're at in 2022, 
you know, we know that smoking rates uh, have enormously reduced, particularly in, in, in kind of Western industrial populations. We know that uh, population-wide body weight and adiposity has, has increased significantly. And that's one of the reasons why cardiovascular disease remains a significant uh, mortality burden in populations. And then we've got the kind of intermediate risk factors like blood pressure and blood cholesterol. And as far as dairy goes, again, this umbrella term, this is where a, a really good example of why we need to be granular. Okay. So we can't say that there is just an impact of dairy per se on blood cholesterol levels, for example, because it depends on the type of dairy. Um, certainly the early epidemiology and indeed everything we know now about butter shows that butter has quite a pronounced impact on raising LDL cholesterol and, and ApoB to, uh, lipoproteins. And, and we know that from robustly controlled metabolic ward studies that have literally fed people <laughs> butter specifically in relation and, and other kind of uh, and other f uh, sources of fat. Um, and, and this is a good example of why these processes that we talked about are important. So because butter is churned to refine it, that process of refinement of butter removes a protective layer uh, around the milk fat. Um, it removes other beneficial aspects of dairy. Uh, for example, like the calcium content is significantly lower um, than it would be in, say, a yogurt or a cheese. Uh, so you kind of end up really with a pure saturated fat that's absent the other food matrix characteristics that, say, a yogurt or a cheese have. And we have a number of interventions that have compared butter to cheese. And you would see, depending on the background diet, depending on the intervention, we uniformly butter will have a much greater impact on raising LDL cholesterol levels. And cheese, depending on the background diet and the level of cheese, um, either has a neutral effect or in some cases a, a modest cholesterol lowering effect. Um, and so that's an important because that's not only a comparison within the class of dairy, it's a comparison within the class of saturated fat and saturated fatty acids. And it doesn't extend to other food sources of saturated fat, even beyond just the category of dairy. Uh, so, you know, people have really tried to, in particularly review papers, to really overstate the specific findings in relation to dairy and in relation to cheese and yogurt specifically, to then mount a wider argument that, hey, you know, this is why we can't say saturated fat is associated with cardiovascular disease. And it's a really gross over extrapolation of what is actually quite a narrow exception. And it's not an exception that proves the rule in this context, mm -hmm. right? So Can I ask you a question on that. Yeah. So you're so what you're saying there is that for some reason, despite the saturated fat content in yogurt and in cheese, it's not having the effect on blood cholesterol that one may predict. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. What and and if someone's listening and thinking, okay, that's that's interesting. And you mentioned there some of the properties of butter mm -hmm. that that lead to butter having this effect on cholesterol. But are there any sort of inherent properties in cheese and yogurt that are possibly explaining? You know, why you don't see that, that yeah. some properties that are blunting the effect of saturated fat, for example. Yes, there are a number that relate to the overall food matrix in this context. So the main interaction is in relation to calcium itself um, and a, th a thing known as the milk fat globule membrane. I'll explain what that means. And then there's potentially also a role for the casein content within the protein as well, within this whole food matrix. So let's start with the fat content itself. When, when you have dairy fat before it's refined to produce a food like butter, that fat, and particularly with fermentation, might actually kind of alter the properties of this. But the fat is wrapped within this casein protein matrix. Imagine that the fat... <laughs> 
is like surrounded by a kind of encapsulated layer. And this is known as the milk fat globule membrane. And when you have dairy fat within that kind of membrane, encapsulated mm -hmm. within that milk fat globule membrane, it doesn't have that negative impact on blood cholesterol levels. And actually it might have a role in kind of interacting with the liver to kind of slightly lower uh, cholesterol synthesis. And then you've got the calcium aspect as well, which when consumed in the context of dairy, I mean, calcium, this is a property of calcium anyway, but when dairy food specifically, you get the formation of what are known as calcium soaps. Um, and these are kind of complexes in, in, at the level of, of, of intestinal absorption that actually reduce the overall absorption of fat. And you see an increased excretion of fat um, mm -hmm. and so this is also something that is observed with dairy foods rich in calcium, like cheese or yogurt, but you don't see it with butter because the calcium is depleted during the churning to refine the butter. Mm -hmm. And so potentially it is an interaction with this mix of the casein matrix, the milk fat globule membrane and the calcium within this whole food matrix. Mm -hmm. And that is likely then something in terms of the casein and calcium content that's preserved with low fat dairy produce. But with the low fat dairy produce, you obviously have an overall less actual contribution of, of total dairy fat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is where we see more inconsistent kind of associations for the most part. But overall, you know, if you were really parsing it, low fat dairy produce particularly is associated with, you know, reduce strongly, more strongly associated with reduced risk of stroke, for example, and other cardiovascular disease endpoints. Um, and it, it's possible that it relates to these uh, factors that I've been describing. I mean, these, these mechanistic explanations have been shown in, in interventions and in mechanistic research. So they're providing a degree of biological plausibility to why we don't see necessarily the risk associated with butter that you would see consistently mm -hmm. in cardiovascular disease with foods that are kind of fermented in the way of, say, cheese or, or yogurts. Has anyone gone a little bit more granular? Because I guess as I'm kind of picturing the grocery shelf or, or foods at a restaurant, uh, mozzarella cheese, you know, it looks like it, it, it's fairly different to say a camembert or a brie in terms of processing. And then from a yogurt perspective, there's, you know, Greek yogurt and, and a whole bunch of other types of, of yogurt. Um, do we know anything about the specific types of cheese and yogurt and their kind of unique effects on on cholesterol and, and other risk factors? I, I haven't seen necessarily any specific, I mean, within individual studies, yes, I mean, I can think of one that was um, conducted by one of the, the groups at University College Dublin, and they used cheddar specifically, and they did have a differentiation between like the fat content of the cheddar, um, but it wasn't comparing, say, cheddar to camembert. Um, and so... Um, that obviously would be really interesting. I think ultimately, you know, that the kind of the properties of the process of fermentation itself are, are likely yielding similar-ish characteristics. Um, but I haven't necessarily seen that level of like comparison other than within single studies and the specific selection of foods that they've used. Uh, but like I said, I, I didn't... Um, you know, that some of those studies haven't compared specifically mm -hmm. the actual types of, of cheese necessarily. So that's that's yogurt, cheese, and, and butter. Are there any studies that have looked at milk and cholesterol levels? Yes. Uh, and this milk has been used, again, in some of the experimental kind of early, like metabolic ward studies. Um, and... The, the the role of milk and milk, uh, the fat content of the milk, seems in some degree to be mediated by the background level of, of total saturated fat in the diet. Um, and if it's, you know, if it's high, you might get like more of a contribution overall to the adverse effects. 
an LDL cholesterol of a high total saturated fat diet. Mm -hmm. Um, And in the context of a low background, lower background saturated fat content, it, it appears to be like not as having the kind of neutral to, to kind of slight lowering effect that milk or dairy would, or sorry, that cheese or yogurt would. Um, it, it appears to be like slightly neutral or having a modest raising effect. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and the epidemiology certainly of, of milk specifically as it relates to cardiovascular disease um, is largely uh either kind of mixed or null but again when you then parse that right because we we're now using another kind of umbrella term right we're saying milk right can we differentiate that even further in relation to its fat content and that's where you will find more um potentially consistent associations with milk overall like whole milk having a kind of neutral effect. Some studies, again, depending on the population, you might find high milk consumption associated with an increased risk. And this is whole milk now, but low fat milk and low fat dairy consistently associated with the other direction of effect and lower risk of hypertension, stroke, and other cardiovascular related outcomes. How important here is considering the comparison food or substitution. So if a uh, study is showing that dairy or a certain type of dairy is increasing risk or neutral or reducing risk, um, it's always being sort of compared to something or, or people that are uh, presumably getting their calories from some other food. Mm-hmm. And so this gets me sort of wondering, because you mentioned there like saturated fats in in dairy are, are different to to say red meat and, and, and seem to have a different effect on cholesterol. And I'm thinking of that study uh, by Chen. Yeah. You and I have shared that a few times. The one looking at the US uh, cohorts and, mm-hmm. and they were looking at the substitution can you kind of speak to, I guess, the the what you think of that paper and and the relevance of this substitution? Yes. So I think this is a really important uh, kind of question that relates both to our specific topic here in relation to dairy, but also you know coming back to this idea of methodology, uh, you know, improving and and considering methodology. Uh, because th- this this question of compared to what I think is getting probably used maybe in the wrong context in some of the social media conversations, um, you know, ultimately these substitution analyses are something that are becoming much more uh, popular as an approach because they allow you to model the changing effect of a certain amount of energy in the diet one nutrient for another, for example. Um, And that allows you to, on paper, model more realistic change. But it's a statistical concept primarily used in regression analyses. And I think it's it's really important that we note that 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 effect of what you're essentially swapping in that analysis still relates to the the, the population you are comparing this mm-hmm. replacement and substitution in. So I think this is a really um, becoming a more common methodological approach, but we need to also um, be careful with uh, how we then interpret and extrapolate that. And I'll, I'll contrast the Chen paper with, with some other research in this. Mm-hmm. And then I think we need to be careful about over simplistically assuming that nutrient-based substitution necessarily then automatically translates to food-based substitution. Uh, And, you know, food-based substitution is slightly more kind of difficult to do for a few reasons. But, you know, if you're going to change 5% of energy from any type of fat, dairy fat or whatever, uh, with another fat subtype, you have to then think, well, what would these food-based changes amount to in the population? Um, And that becomes a relevant consideration for, for wider nutritional changes in that diet. And then the final consideration I would say, like before we kind of jump into it, is I see this compared to what I think more kind of oversimplistically being used to just then make these food-based, well, you know, what if this food replaces that food? And it's like, 
that's not really how people make changes with diet, right? You know, we're not talking about just, we, we could stand up any food, one food against mm-hmm. another and say, this was the relative risk in that study and this is the relative risk in that study, so this is better. And again, it's, it's not really uh, an accurate mm-hmm. reflection of, of dietary change. Mm. You need to consider the the practicality component as well is often lost. Sure. So, for example, if you consider, say, replacing dairy with whole grains, well, that's that's interesting, but they they have different utility. Yes. So it's it's not really a great comparison from the point of view of when someone's standing in front of the shelf. Yeah. If they're not, if they're going to put that that bottle of milk down. What, what are they going to choose instead? And, and that's one thing that I've often thought about these substitution analyses is that they need to introduce a kind of reality aspect to them. Right. It becomes too either or, right? Because mm-hmm. if we're building always back up to the level of dietary pattern, why can't someone consume their Greek yogurt and their whole grains, right? So it's just we need to just think slightly more about how we extrapolate these things. But the, the Chen paper you were referencing was an, an analysis of the three major U.S. cohort studies. So the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. And they were looking at dairy fat. And then they were looking uh, specifically then at modeling replacing dairy fats with other fat subtypes, right? And in particular, polyunsaturated fat replacing dairy fat. And this is polyunsaturated fat, kind of plant sources, vegetable oils, nuts, seeds, was associated with a 24% relative risk reduction of cardiovascular disease, 26% lower risk of coronary heart disease, 22% lower risk of stroke. And these were quite robust findings in terms of the precision of the estimate of effect. And, but, but this is nothing necessarily that new to us, right? Because we know that just generally speaking, the replacement of polyunsaturated fat from these sources, replacing any other fat subtype, even if they replace monounsaturated fats relative to the source of monounsaturated fats, we're going to generally see this benefit. We're talking about from a cardiovascular health perspective, the most beneficial of the fat subtypes. And then we have to think about like the background population that these studies are conducted in overall, where we're not talking about high diet quality for the most part compared to other cohorts. And and then the second point is that, okay, what is this food base? So we're talking about a simple nutrient exchange in a regression model. What's the potential implication of that? down, you know, down the line, for example. Um, and actually, there, there's a really interesting follow-up from that, from a group that uh, looked at what would be the food-based implications of doing this nutrient-based change, right? So you remove 5% of dietary energy from the dairy fat, and you have a knock-on effect then in terms of, so to do that would require eliminating 65% of total dairy foods then from that individual's diet. That's a big change. So when we talk about these substitution studies, we say 5% replacement of energy, of energy. So Mm -hmm. people think 5%, that's nothing. No, but to achieve that 5% change of energy at the level of foods would require someone eliminating essentially Mm -hmm. two thirds of their current intake of a food group. And that would have ramifications for their dietary calcium, vitamin A, vitamin B12, and vitamin D, which were the specific nutrients of interest looked at in that study that considered the food-based replacement. So it's not as simple as just saying this change translates automatically to kind of this. And there's, for the American population, there would be different. Now, you haven't seen that quite level of similar substitution analysis in wider cohorts, but if you look at some of the data from the European perspective investigation into cancer cohorts, you, you typically see these kind of null associations with modeling replacement and substitution, uh, even with polyunsaturated fats. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Again, the types of foods like milk is the is the biggest intake in those U.S. cohorts. It's typically not in in a lot of the European cohorts. It's more cheese and yogurt, um, and there's background saturated fat content as well. 
is lower in some of these European cohorts. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of different factors that are going into the outcomes of these studies. So while absolutely in that US population of those three cohorts, that was the outcome, I would say that, yeah, like in that, if we're going to really realistically interpret that for the, for the population studied, are they better off shifting either their total, you know, dairy intake or their choice of dairy? The milk is like the most, the biggest contributor in the background and their overall dietary pattern. Yes, they're, they're, they're a population with low background diet quality um, and a range of other factors going into it. So, but I think we need to be careful not to then take an analysis of three cohorts and extrapolate that as holding true in, invariantly across every other population. Playing devil's advocate here, and this probably, again, applies more to particular Western countries, but where cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and I believe the average LDL cholesterol is about 120 to 130 milligrams per deciliter. Mm -hmm. Would it not be sensible to swap that glass of of full fat dairy milk for, and I'm going to say it, a glass of soy milk? <laughs> oh, you're just <laughs> you're just playing to my love of soy now. <laughs> my fridge is full. Um, yeah, I think. Look, I think that there. I think that there. This is where we can probably, you know, start to be a bit more granular at the level of some of these food based considerations that we're discussing. Um, I think for for these for these substitutions, particularly if we're talking about dairy milk. Uh, there's mm-hmm. still a long way that a lot of the kind of plant substitute milk alternatives need to come in terms of matching nutritional content. But that's an industry thing, and I think that that is very much happening. There's you know milks now here that are starting to fortify with iodine. That needs to become more widespread. I personally think it should be mandated because milk would be the biggest, in the mm-hmm. UK population certainly, is the biggest contributing food to overall population iodine status. So mm-hmm. I would say if we're talking about cardiovascular risk, yeah, would that be a good food swap? Probably for someone that's looking to get their cholesterol like lower. But overall, but again, this, this comes into the nitty gritty of why we can't just necessarily broadly and very generally make some of these kind of recommendations without actually thinking about other ramifications for the total diet and nutrient intake. Um, But yeah, I mean, if someone was consuming, if I think about, for example, just to run with the UK example, population wise, and we're kind of still sitting at this like 13% dietary saturated fat content, right? And even though, yes, we can make these kind of uh, somewhat exceptions for yogurt or cheese, they're not foods that are consumed in particularly high amounts. You might get like an average of like 80 grams a day yogurt and maybe 30 to 60 grams a day of cheese. They're not foods that are being consumed. They're not major contributors to that overall saturated fat content. Uh, Mm -hmm. So would someone consuming a high intake of whole milk uh, be... Uh, from a cardiovascular health perspective, assisted by replacing that and helping to reduce their overall sat fat content down to 10% of food energy or lower, then I would say, yes, that's a good swap to make. Mm. Um, but we would then want them to be considering about these other factors, right? Mm. Um, and, and helping them understand where to fill in any potential kind of, mm. yeah, I, iodine was the really good example we just mm. used there. Yeah, yeah, I think the the... Uh, nutrition dietetics world would definitely welcome mandating iodine fortification in plant-based milks. I know that I used to I used to talk about the importance of I mean I still do the importance of iodine particularly uh, on a plant-based diet. The more you move towards plant exclusive, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that the prevalence of iodine deficiency increases. Mm-hmm. Um, as you remove dairy and seafood in particular um, from the diet. And I did previously used to also recommend seaweed, but with more reading and looking at the the sort of inconsistent levels of iodine that are in seaweed and yeah. also the, the ability for people to sustain that and adhere to that in their diet can be a bit tricky. Currently, my advice is, 
is if you're not consuming dairy or uh, seafood is iodized salt or probably uh, better off with an iodine supplement. But I would love to see it through the the, the food system in plant-based milks and yogurts. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, they're, they're doing things obviously like with B12 more consistently. Um, but, but there's little things like there's a lot of them still fortify with vitamin D2, which is not, you know, bioequivalent to D3. There are D3 that you can get now to fortify from mm-hmm. like non, you know, animal mm-hmm. sources. From algae. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so look, this is, this is, this is all, the, the, you know, that the, they're kind of, you know, important aspects to consideration of replacement in a diet. And, you know, I think it's one of the, the, the things that you do particularly best within the plant-based community is I think there's a lot of people now that are just kind of shying away almost afraid to admit that there's, oh, there's these things you're going to consider. And I think you do a great job Mm. for the community of being responsible and actually considering uh, these are the ramifications of these changes. And let's have a conversation about how you can go about making sure that you get what you need. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, all diets, pretty much all diets, you know, have some sort of limitation or area that you need to focus and get educated on. And rather than pretending they don't exist, yeah. <laughs> better off <laughs> identify them yeah. and plan accordingly and and you're likely to get the best result. You mentioned there that that, that dairy is not actually per, uh, accounting for most of the saturated fat, at least in the, in the, the diet in the UK. And if, if someone is, is listening and is thinking, well, what are the foods that actually are contributing to most of the saturated fat intake? What are they? Yeah. So it's interesting now. It's like, you know, so yes, whole, whole milk still does make a, a contribution, but it's nowhere near where it was. Um, a lot of the saturated fat in the diet now still comes from meat and meat products and meat being an, a kind of an overall term here, right? Like, you know, beef, pork, lamb. Um, and so beef and beef products and then confectionery, you know, biscuits and cakes and, you know, chocolate and this kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's the, the, the biggest contributors overall are, you know, meat, meat and meat products and, uh, and confectionery of, of various sorts. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, like whole milk does make a contribution to that. But again, if we were thinking about, and I know we use that example of would someone benefit from replacing their, you know, 300 mil of whole milk with 300 milk of soy. But if we were going even more granular with that again and thinking, well, overall diet quality as it relates to cardiovascular disease, I wouldn't be telling someone to, you know, make any sort of like change if it didn't necessarily come with, say, thinking about their meat intake and the like level of I guess, discretionary foods in the diet, you know, there's, there's Mm -hmm. lower hanging fruit to pick there than someone having a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a a good, good bit of perspective. Um, one study that sometimes comes up here, Alan, is the pure study Yeah, that I see people point to as evidence that, that, that dairy lowers the risk of cardiovascular disease sort of across the board. What did you make of the Pure study? What do you What are your thoughts on the the kind of findings from yeah. it? Yeah. So, in in so far as we just made the point in relation to the Chen analysis of U.S. cohorts that we need to really always think about population specificity, that exact same consideration has to apply to Pure, but in the almost inverse of what we would consider when we're thinking about a Western and kind of industrialized population. The majority of the cohorts in PURE was conducted across 18 um, different countries, the majority of which were low to middle income, in which there was an enormous proportion of the cohorts in nutritional inadequacy across different ranges. And so the idea that there was this uniform reduction across the board where we wouldn't typically see that in a western industrialized population we would typically see more granular well this food neutral this food maybe associate you know if we're talking about dairy say low fat dairy more associated butter associated with increased risk the the fact that like you've got this umbrella finding for dairy in these cohorts 
is is should be considered unsurprising because we're talking about populations largely that had a lot of nutritional inadequacy in which the addition of nutrient dense food groups is going to have a benefit where a lot of these cohorts were relying on kind of dietary staples like white rice so we even saw people use pure to say that overall saturated fat is associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease. But you look at the spread of intake in Pure, and they were comparing people with only 2% of dietary intake. Even if you're exclusively plant-based, you'd have more than your total daily energy intake from than 2% of saturated fat. So the, these were these were a, these were nutritionally vulnerable populations a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And so the context in which dairy is consumed in in a lot of these populations is entirely different to the background right. context in which dairy is being consumed in a country with high animal meat intake and and high saturated fat and high processed food intake. And Mm -hmm. and a good good example of that, I think, for listeners at a slightly more kind of granular example is, you know, if you look at populations in India, uh, and there has been research looking specifically at the, you know, potential, uh, so that you've got a high prevalence of stunting in the population. And Mm -hmm. they've looked specifically at the contribution of proteins in the diet to, you know, to to maintaining, you know, uh, overall growth trends. And even like minor additions of say, you know, 200 mil of milk a day would, would almost be sufficient to, you know, dramatically reduce the incidence of stunting in these populations. So, it's the context that really matters here in terms of mm-hmm. who are we researching? What's the background diet? What's their nutritional adequacy overall? And what's the context of this food being added to? So I, 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 would, I would be really hesitant with the, the way that pure is generalized by people um, across the board, you know. Yeah, I think that's a really, it's a, probably a whole nother conversation about the childhood stunting. But um, something I've thought about when considering, I guess, the ethical aspects of dairy, we often think about the the animal welfare issues, which are extremely important. But there's also a, a kind of human ethics conversation around food security as well. And that kind of ties back to my interest in precision fermentation. Um, I'm not sure if it is going to be a solution to some of that stuff, but um, hopefully it could be. I, I think it's I think it's a really incredibly, um, and I haven't listened to the full episode yet, um, but I'm I'm really looking forward to to actually listening to what this kind of technology um can can potentially do as well because yeah like like you said if there's if there's the capacity to produce this absent the animal welfare implications and and environmental implications then why not (laughs) because it's you know because you have the capacity to produce you know healthy foods that can form part of a healthy dietary pattern and the other uh thing that I just wanted to comment on there when you were talking about pure is the what you just discussed then is another reason for why often when we're thinking about a certain food and whether it's healthy or not or has a negative effect on health or a positive effect on health sometimes it's quite helpful to look within the one population who live very similar lifestyles and and break down their kind of exposure into quintiles, for example. I I think that we need to always be kind of g- granular uh, with uh, looking at a given population um, and thinking about because even though you know we can use things like adjustment models, right, to try and isolate more independent effects of a given exposure on your outcome that adjustment model doesn't wipe away the background character, characteristics of your mm-hmm. cohort. You're, you're, you're weighting an average of that, of that variable across your whole cohort. So 
People say, oh, well, here's this study in this population and they adjusted for smoking. It's like, it doesn't mean that the participants never smoked, right? <laughs> like, it's not an absolution of smoking 20 cigarettes a day. So my point here is that we need to be careful with potentially falling into ecological fallacy when we just say, well, here's this cohort in the US and they found this. And it's like, well, and here's this cohort in Sweden and they found this. And it's like, that, that's probably too simplistic a comparison. Um, and, you know, when we reconcile evidence and when we try and piece together consistency with evidence, it's important that we're really considering a lot of these factors. So just as an example, and I, I know we've, we've kind of discussed this before, but I think it's a good example to bring people to, to kind of like what we're talking about here. And it's, it's not in relation to dairy specifically, it's in relation to red meat, right? So you will consistently find in any of the U.S. cohorts high intake of red meat compared to low associated with any number of adverse outcomes, right? But then someone will come along and say, aha, well, here's this European cohort and there's no risk. Or here's this Japanese cohort and they have lower risk, right? <laughs> but then you go and you look at the comparisons and the background characteristics and you find that high intake in the Japanese cohort was 77 grams a day, whereas in the US cohort, it could have been 177 grams a day. And then you look at the background characteristics of the high group, and in the US cohort, you see that the high red meat group also had the highest rates of smoking and obesity and other risk factors. But then you look at the Japanese cohort, and you actually see that in the lowest intake of red meat group, they had higher rates of smoking alcohol, lower vegetable and fruit intake, right? So it's the inverse. So the background characteristics of your comparison matter. And actually, when you start to really get granular with dose, you can actually find more consistent associations at higher levels of intake, even in European mm -hmm. populations. And that's where we're then able to come to a more overall conclusion that actually there is a strength of evidence here, but we need to be more granular with thinking about what exactly the exposure is in different populations. And I think that that absolutely as a consideration applies to dairy intake. Yeah, and absolutely. If we're taking, if you're, if you're studying a population on the Adriatic coast and they consume a wider Mediterranean diet, uh, including, you know, fish and otherwise, and, you know, plentiful plant foods. And they have dairy intake on top of that. And it's specifically more kind of yogurts, cheese, and in some cases, kind of things like goat's milk and otherwise. You, you, you can't assume that that is this exact same exposure as a population in, say, the US consuming butter, like milk, high to like high meat intake, et cetera, right? A completely different dietary pattern in a population with a higher background risk. Um, and so, yeah, it's important that we think about all of these things and don't try to come to kind of overly general and simplistic conclusions if they're not available for us to do so. Are there any other sort of... Um markers of cardio metabolic health that we haven't spoken about uh, perhaps some of of mario kratz's work or or other researchers looking at the the effect of dairy on these markers um i mean i, th I think i think some of the research on the 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 kind of the glucose tolerance is is interesting um i'm i'm still at this point less obviously the a lot of those um, studies came from wider associations within the epidemiology of lower risk of diabetes, right? So they were like, well, maybe there is this uh, benefit to uh, dairy from a kind of more metabolic perspective rather than just from a purely, say, cardiovascular risk factor uh, perspective. Um and so, you know, that's being kind of looked at in a, a number of interventions. But I think my sense of that literature is that it's slightly more inconsistent than the effects that we would see in terms of the uh, butter versus cheese studies in relation to um blood lipids, for example. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I look at like one of the, you know, 
particularly um, with with some of the studies that came out of of, of Kratz's group's research on this, you know, a, a lot of it was, you know, and people said, well, this is like no effect of dairy, so it's probably not, uh, you know, it's probably not what we thought it was, so to speak, as far as like potential like metabolic effects. Um, and, and actually, like a lot of that study was, you know, more kind of secondary outcomes with this is like comparing low fat dairy to full fat dairy and looking mm-hmm. at different outcomes. Um, and really what you saw was just no real difference in terms of oral glucose tolerance tests. And you saw this like this different indices, like the insulin sensitivity index, for example. And this was comparing like limited dairy, whole fat or like high fat dairy or low fat dairy. And you saw like an increase in the ISI, but like the actual magnitude of these changes was really minor. A lot of them and a lot of them were kind of more secondary outcomes. So I don't know that this was the kind of nail in the coffin to the potential role of dairy from a more metabolic perspective Mm -hmm. um, than it sometimes is kind of made out to be. Alan, was that in uh, healthy adults or was that in uh, adults that had impaired blood glucose control? Um, The participants in this particular study actually met, this is the obviously the umbrella term of metabolic syndrome. So these were mm-hmm. participants with metabolic syndrome. So that gotcha. you know that this could be obviously a, a consideration as well. Um, but you know, like I, I think if we think about, say, the insulin sensitivity outcome, right? So there was no difference in the oral glucose tolerance tests, and then there was these differences in some of these insulin sensitivity kind of markers. One is the Matsuda insulin sensitivity index, right? And so with this, a score of less than uh, like four. Point three is an I- indication of insulin resistance. And the baseline mm. ISI scores for each group, limited dairy, low fat and high fat dairy, was like 2.2, 2.4 and 1.2. So those in the high fat dairy group, they, they were all really insulin resistance at baseline. And the actual, the absolute change in the scores was pretty minimal, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, the baseline scores, uh, and this, this, this was the same for HOMA IR as well. So over 2.9 indicates insulin resistance. The baseline scores were 2.5, 3.3, and 3.0 in the limited dairy, low fat dairy, and high fat dairy groups. So, and the absolute changes in these scores were fairly small. So I think this is an example with any study, but particularly intervention trials, where we need to think between statistical significance as an arbitrary mm-hmm. threshold of a p-value that was reached versus mm-hmm. actual magnitude of change and uh, clinical um, meaningfulness or clinical significance, right. so to speak. What was the 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 duration of that trial, and was it were people just given a, a sort of set controlled portion of dairy calorie controlled or were they was it ad lib so it was 12 weeks um and the kind of they had like a a run-in period of like a month where they Mm -hmm. basically like limited dairy to like like really low i was thinking it's less than like three servings a week um Mm -hmm. and then and then they were kind of randomized um and they also had these kind of like periods where study foods were p- provided to participants to provide an energy surplus. Um, and so th- th- this was kind of like a, a study within the study, these two five day periods where they had this like surplus. And this was consumed from, you know, like da- with the dairy foods then on top of the energy surplus. Um, and it was basically, they were trying to see whether. In eating more dairy foods like led to a compensatory decrease in your energy intake from from other foods um right but yeah like it was a food-based intervention which was really good so the full fat dairy diet was like three and a half servings of you know uh whole milk yogurt cheese a day and then the low fat dairy diet was also three and a half servings but of non-fat versions of milk yogurt and cheese mm-hmm. um 
against this low diet. So like, it, it, look, it was a really, really good study in terms of like its question. It's I think the, the four win four week washing period was really good. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not at a point just based on this research alone to say that there is absolutely no, uh, that, that a, either the findings are entirely representative of, uh, like a, a real, like worsening, um, mm-hmm. in, in a kind of an absolute sense, like home IR is probably the one that like went up. Um, but again, the absolute changes were fairly small. And like, again, the, the, the Matsuda index, even though that was statistically significant, it's like, you know, the actual like mean change in, in each group uh, was was small. And their overall glucose yeah. tolerance test was was small. Uh, was, there was no significant difference. And I think there's, a, there's an extra layer of geekiness. We can talk about the use of oral glucose tolerance test uh, results to try and calculate like insulin sensitivity and it's not a particularly like HOMA IR is different because it's calculated from fasting mm-hmm. insulin and glucose but I think we need to also kind of be um you know yeah there, there's some limitations to kind of using mm-hmm. oral glucose tolerance tests as a tee-off to, to calculate mm-hmm. insulin sensitivity. As a kind of cliff note um What's your kind of current position with regards to dairy and its effect on blood glucose levels, insulin sensitivity? I think I would want to, well, in terms of blood glucose levels, certainly the OGTT from this study would suggest potentially not uh, like any sort of detrimental impact. Um, I think cohort studies, you know, like dairy is dairy protective prospectively like if people who are otherwise healthy is dairy intake because of the findings based on this study are we going to then say that dairy intake is associated with people developing type 2 diabetes i think on the overall evidence that's a difficult case to make right now prospectively in terms of the observation research particularly low fat dairy is pretty consistently associated with with lower risk and we know that Targeted interventions with whey proteins lower the magnitude of postprandial glycemic responses. We've seen that with some of the preload studies. So I think, again, we discussed the importance of being granular with, with your population that you're studying in a, in a cohort study and not falling prey to over-extrapolation. Um, and I think that that equally applies, of course, it does to intervention trials. So we could conclude that in, mm-hmm. you know, in those studies from Kratz's group in participants with metabolic syndrome, dairy intake is likely not going to necessarily reverse the underlying metabolic dysfunction. And it might slightly worsen some aspects of insulin resistance, but the magnitude of that difference is, is pretty small. Um, and so I would, I would be kind of (laughs) that unsatisfactory position of let's, let's see some more research Mm -hmm. come out on this topic first but I think mm-hmm. for metabolic health, potentially then one might actually want to think more about opting for low-fat dairy produce. Mm-hmm. On that point of dairy or preloading uh, whey protein having a beneficial effect on blood glucose, if I heard correctly, yes, that also sounds like something I've heard Nicola Guest talk about yes. with regards to protein. So is that something that is specific to whey protein or just protein in general having this sort of beneficial knock-on effect? Overall, we do know that dietary protein and higher dietary protein is kind of generally beneficial for uh, like glycemic control, but they're the interventions to date that have looked at the preloading do certainly suggest that whey protein in particular and uh, has, has a beneficial effect on postprandial glucose responses to a meal then subsequently. And they're usually served about 10 to 15 minutes after that protein preload. And it, it might mm-hmm. be because the for the for whey protein in particular seems to be um, quite insulinogenic. Um, but it's not just that it has this effect on insulin specifically, it activates and, and, you know, creates quite a, quite a a big response from incretin hormones. So these are things like GLP one and GIP and those incretin hormones augment, uh, 
the insulin response. Now, when we're thinking metabolic health, I was actually talking to Drew about this recently. Um, you know, it's kind of like, well, we're talking about people with diabetes. Do we do we want a big insulin response? But it's like this is first phase insulin response, so this is a good thing. Okay, so you're you're getting this stimulation of GLP one and GIP that augments your first phase insulin response. So you get that response from the from the pancreas and the beta mm-hmm. cells, and and you get this kind of lowering of postprandial glucose. But there's also another mechanism that's independent of insulin, which is interesting, which is that GLP one feeds back to the stomach and kind of has a role in regulating the pace of gastric emptying. And if you slow the rate of gastric emptying, you get an attenuated time course of delivery of glucose to the blood. Now, to your question, and I did discuss this with with, with True, okay, is it specific to whey? The short answer is we haven't had any of these studies compare a whey to like a soy protein for at the same level of protein or even at the same level of leucine. Now, is is it the amino acid composition potentially. So I think that research would be really interesting to do. Some of the studies have looked at protein and fiber mixed together in these kind of bars. And of course, you know, fiber, you might have an effect on slowing gastric emptying anyway. Um, but we, we currently don't have studies that have specifically compared protein types on this postprandial response. And I think that would be really interesting to do. I might have to, uh, make a phone call to Big Soy after yeah. this and uh, I'll see if they can come up with some sort of high fiber tofu bar. They can, um, they can fund me. I'm all about soy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, something else that comes up here and this is kind of comes back to the question I asked about how long was this study? Was it ad lib? Is energy balance and, and of course, uh, weight gain will increase the risk of uh, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, etc., non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I'm interested, if I recall correctly, was it this study and, and what you mentioned or has Kratz separately looked at whether full fat dairy is kind of inherently fattening like some people may assume compared to to low fat dairy? Do we Do we have any sort of sense if you add – dairy into someone's diet, whether it results in uh, an increase in in caloric intake? Yeah, so so this was so when we were discussing that the approach to that um, really cool Kratz intervention, uh, mm-hmm. we kind of mentioned that there was this like study within a study. So there were these right, five. Okay, so that was that. Yeah, so there was these periods of like five-day controlled feeding periods, right? Separate five-day, two separate five-day periods of controlled overfeeding to achieve a 25% energy surplus in the context of this additional, uh, of the dairy food consumption. So, mm-hmm. so they were asked to continue consuming their dairy foods and then consume the rest of the desire, the, the, the diet with the target of overconsumption, obviously, um, to, but to a level desires. They didn't have to eat the entire 25% energy surplus because what was being tested was if you're eating these dairy foods and you're, you're hitting your 3.3 servings a day and we're offering you all this extra food, is there some kind of compensatory response mm-hmm. that, that eating dairy foods might give you. Um, so, but there was, there, there was an increase in energy intake in both groups. And that greatest increase was in the high fat dairy group. But again, that this was predictable because in the five day period of this kind of like, you know, study within a study overfeeding, the low fat dairy group had like 281 extra calories a day and the high fat group had 463 extra calories mm-hmm. a day and so you know an analysis finds then a relationship between you know uh like uh, you know extra energy intake um and and body weight and they're like well but but you know, from what I could ever see in that paper, there was actually no claim or hypothesis made about the potential satiating effects of dairy foods. So, so when I looked at that study, the kind of way I framed the the outcomes of that study within a study is like, 
it's like they were saying, we fed participants more and then they didn't eat less and body weight increased. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm cautious on really making any sort of, of interpretation on that, you know. Um, mm-hmm. it's, if, if it was in the context of, you know, a, a more free living where you're feeding people these foods and then looking at is there uh, like an enhanced reduction in energy or something? I think that would be a potentially more direct effect. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's like, it's literally saying we fed participants deliberately more and then they didn't eat less <laughs> so, and, right. and, and body weight increased. So yeah, of course mm-hmm. that happens, you know. So what would you do if you were, say you wanted to lose weight mm. and uh, we're speaking here about someone that consumes dairy, would would you have a, a, a preference over full fat versus low fat dairy? I probably would be thinking in this context about the very known and well-established role of dietary protein generally in satiety, in, you know, uh, like enhancing adherence to diets um, and all of the roles that increasing dietary protein has. So yeah, I would typically end up recommending something like a non-fat Greek yogurt simply because the protein content of that, you know, you're getting like 11 grams per 100 grams in the context of no added fat and, you know, just normal kind of dairy dairy sugars, carbohydrates, and it's only like three to four grams if it's not a flavored one. So yeah, like a natural non-fat high protein Greek yogurt, something like a skier, you know, the Icelandic Greek yogurt or any, any kind of high protein Greek yogurt would typically be the type of food I was recommending to someone from that context. But that's really just aiming for like getting something that's like not overall high in energy. Uh, so it's low energy density, but high, very high in protein. And, um, you know, and, and that's the ben- that's possibly the benefit there. I recently had uh, Professor Christopher Gardner on mm. the show or back on. He's been on a few times. And I'm sure you saw his, uh, I think it was 17 week, I think it was a uh, 10 week intervention on fermented foods with a run-in period, fermented foods and, and fiber um, that he did with Justin Sonnenberg and they were looking at markers of inflammation mm-hmm. and how for some fermented foods may affect these versus fiber. Um, where I'm going with this is not the specifics of that study but rather that they, they did to see seem to see some reduction in, uh, in markers of inflammation on the fermented food group yes. um, side of things quite consistently. And within that intervention was some advice to include kefir, which is a, a dairy product. You can get it non-dairy. Um, but I think their recommendation in that study was a dairy version. They also recommended the consumption of yogurt in addition to foods like kombucha and kraut and kimchi and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite, it's a little hard to kind of tease out the indep- independent effects of single foods. But nonetheless, they saw that when people were eating these fermented foods, it seemed to reduce some markers of inflammation and seemed to change the microbiome in a way that current evidence would suggest is favorable. There does seem to be a lot of claims out there, however, that dairy is pro-inflammatory. I see it online quite a bit and I I think some of the listeners will have come across that. So I'm interested in what you think of that idea, where it comes from, and if we look at the overall evidence that exists, what you think about dairy and its effect on inflammation. Yeah, I don't really know where it comes from. I mean, it might just be part of the wider, you know, uh, kind of general ne- negative press <laughs> um, that 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 dairy gets, um, and I, I don't know why it's kind of held on to specifically. But certainly, from the perspective of you know uh, interventions that have looked at this, um, and even mechanistic understanding. Like there is little to know. I mean, there was a huge, there was a big um, 
uh, review in 2017 or 18, which had 52 intervention trials looking at inflammatory markers, and they constructed this inflammatory score. Um, and basically, you know, this showed the opposite, like an anti-inflammatory uh, overall effect of, uh, of of dairy products in humans. Um, and particularly in subjects with metabolic disorders, there was a stronger anti-inflammatory effect of dairy in people uh, that had like a metabolic condition. There was evidence of a pro-inflammatory effect in people that had an allergy, a cow's milk allergy, which is typically a cow's milk protein allergy. I mean, that's not that's not a that's not a, a a finding we should be too shocked at because they they have a specific cow's milk protein allergy um and so yeah um this this also interestingly didn't depend on the actual fat content of the milk so um low or high fat or and fermented dairy produce as well um overall again anti-inflammatory effects of of the food group so i don't really know where the claim comes from i i do know it's pretty divorced from the reality of the evidence and also you know again the mechanistic plausibility what i found interesting you know about the about the the kefir in the kind of fermented context of the trial was you know when we think about the role of dairy in relation to like gastrointestinal cancer which we typically right. know is is a, is a, is a cancer particularly mediated by inflammatory processes um, especially in the colon um and we have really you know fairly consistent uh, direction of effect and associations between um you know, kind of milk, cheese, dietary calcium from dairy as well, and, and reduced risk mm -hmm. of colorectal cancer. And it's possible that that relates to the anti-inflammatory effect mediated by beneficial effects of, of dairy kind of fatty acids interacting with um, certain kind of bacteria and the production of short chain fatty acids, the contribution directly of short chain fatty acids from some dairy foods. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that there's really any good evidence to support that dairy is inflammatory unless we're talking about someone mm -hmm. with a cow's milk protein allergy, in which case they shouldn't be consuming dairy anyway. Right. So that's just to be clear, a cow's milk dairy allergy is different to lactose intolerance. Yes, yes, yes. Very, yes, yeah, difference. L lactose intolerance is a deficiency in an enzyme required to uh, digest and, and properly break down the lactose sugar, but the protein mm -hmm. allergy is different, yes. Do you think someone with lactose intolerance would perhaps react differently from, a, from an inflammatory marker point of view than someone without it or with a, a lower degree of it uh it's less I mean, degree i i don't necessarily i mean uh so, so i mean some research has compared people with say self-reported lactose intolerance rather than actually clinically confirmed lactose intolerance um mm -hmm. so i think i think the difference between a clinically confirmed versus self-reported is important because you do get a high rate of self-reporting that's very divorced from the actual incidence of clinically diagnosed lactose intolerance. So I think that's one potential factor to, to kind of bear in mind. But, you know, like some of the studies, like we do have evidence of greater dairy intake in, in you know, certain populations that don't historically have a lot of dairy consumption and so don't have like higher rates of that kind of um, uh, a genetic uh, adaptation to lactose uh, breakdown and consumption, um, and you know, I don't think the evidence is is you know particularly overwhelming of mm -hmm. of a, of a kind of a of an inflammatory effect, even kind of in that context. Although it might depend again on the specific population being studied. Right. You mentioned colorectal cancer. And I actually do think the pro-inflammatory -inflam and inflammation claims, I think a lot of them are attached to this conversation about dairy and cancer. Right. And I want you to clear this up for me because, and I did, I wrote about this in, in my book, so anyone who has, has read that will have seen this. But Alan, if I jump on, say, PCRM's website, 
I would I would very quickly believe that that dairy just across the board increases risk of cancer. It just kills you. <laughs> if I was to read a few blogs, yeah. you know, I would leave that website with I I believe in my view, having looked at the research and the World Cancer Research Fund's summary of the research, I would leave the PCRM website, and I think I'm being fair in saying this, I would leave their website with a very skewed view of dairy and its relationship with cancer. Mm -hmm. So can you clarify, uh, provide a summary of the the current evidence, when we look at it in totality, what do we understand about dairy and different forms of cancer? Yeah, so the the, the three kind of most studied are uh, colorectal, uh, breast cancer in women, and, and prostate cancer in men. Um, and I mean, as an overall summary, the evidence for uh, dairy calcium and then specific food sources of like cheese, um, milk, um, and total dairy as a, even a food group is all in relation to colorectal cancer associated with a lower risk. Um, and again, that's been the conclusion reached by the World Cancer Research Fund in their most latest synthesis of the evidence, which they graded as strong evidence that dairy in this umbrella term overall, reduces risk of, of colorectal cancer. And again, we, we've seen that in different cohorts. We've seen it in the Adventist Health Study 2. We've seen it in overall um, meta-analyses that's included cohorts from Europe and otherwise. For prostate cancer, that is a little bit more um, inconsistent, but it's where you would find the opposite more regularly in outcomes. Uh, it, and by opposite, I mean... Um, a consistent increase in prostate cancer risk from either total dairy or milk, cheese, and calcium intake again. Um, now, if you parse that evidence, that is most consistent in North American cohorts. And there does appear to be some mediating effect of dairy calcium within this, which has also been associated um, in, with, with prostate cancer as an outcome. Um, the most kind of, a couple of the most, uh, recent, like synthesis of the evidence, um, basically found that the main mediating effects of the association with prostate cancer were the location of the cohort, the follow-up duration and the actual stage of the cancer. So in North American cohorts, you consistently find an association between total dairy um, and specific foods and prostate cancer, but you don't see that necessarily in Asian cohorts and you see it way less consistency in European cohorts. Is that potentially down to the exposure level or is there something else you think that might explain that? I, I think it's a combination of the, the background characteristics of the populations and included in that background characteristic is the foods and the and and the overall level of 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 intake overall i mean again the right. the the foods that contributes the most do differ um between these cohorts but again i think you know in in certainly within the asian cohorts you do have overall more modest in levels of intake and you do see a more modest level of intake depending on the european cohort included um you do see more kind of moderate levels of intake um, particularly like cheese yo and, and more cheese yogurt than milk, depending on the cohort. And that, that, that is very variable across cohort as to what dairy food contributes the most to the overall umbrella of total dairy intake. So the, again, the World Cancer Research Fund conclusion in relation to prostate cancer is limited suggestive. Um, and I think that's fairly um, reasonably representative of the evidence that there is a suggestion of an increased risk of prostate cancer, but the evidence is limited and it, it, it might be that it's more kind of specific to uh, like these factors, like the actual cohort location and the background characteristics and, and indeed like things like the follow-up duration and stage of cancer.
So this is where I think we need to be careful with falling into ecological fallacy and just holding up one cohort in one place as representative of the exposure overall in all circumstances. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then the last one then is breast cancer. And again, this, this is an interesting one because this is something that gets a lot of, and breast cancer adds complexity to it because we don't just have stage of cancer potentially, but we also have the added factor of menopausal stage. Mm-hmm. So, you know, either premenopausal or postmenopausal. Um, and so, so this makes this particular question really complex because there's the type of dairy, high fat, low fat, you know, yogurt, milk or cheese or all of that that we've discussed. And then there's you know, stage of cancer. And then there's, are they estrogen receptor positive or negative? And then there's menopausal stage. Um, so again, there's no necessarily kind of uh, like a simple answer, but overall the cohorts, um, you know, in certainly in premenopausal women um, and potentially as well with estrogen receptor positive, that there are lower risk uh, in those cohorts in when we start to get granular in terms of defining participants according to some of these characteristics, then there are lower risks observed for dairy uh, consumption and breast cancer that aren't necessarily always observed in, say, people that are estrogen receptor negative. And there's some kind of potential um, suggestion that it's mediated by calcium and vitamin D intake. So again, does this necessarily mean that it's dairy per se or the contribution of these uh, nutrients? Um, you know, and is it possible to get these nutrients from other sources in the diet? Yeah, after all, yes, absolutely. But I think, I think, I think we, you know, the overall direction of effect um, is, is relatively consistent toward a lower risk of dairy consumption mm-hmm. and breast cancer. There are a lot of complexities, like I said, with regard to the actual menopausal state, status, the stage of the cancer, and whether it's you know estrogen receptor positive or negative and the source of dairy. But mm-hmm. more consistently in premenopausal women, and again, potentially mediated by estrogen receptor positive status, we'd see a reduction associated with dairy intake that's possibly mediated by calcium and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And this also, I guess, highlights this importance of if you are choosing for whatever reason to remove dairy, which of course is one of the the things that I want to be really clear here, that you you do need to think about what you're replacing it with. And and here we're emphasizing calcium and vitamin D, potentially the importance of their role in mediating this. Um, But also I think there should be uh, some importance on fermented foods. Mm-hmm. And if you're not consuming cheese and yogurts and fermented dairy, thinking about what fermented foods you have in your diet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if I remember correctly from the research on like, if you're say substituting dairy uh, milk for like a soy milk, um, soy milk, the absorption of the fortified calcium in soy milk, if it's calcium carbonate is equivalent to calcium mm-hmm. absorption from cow's milk but if it's fortified as uh, with tricalcium phosphate that might be uh, kind of up to 20 percent lower calcium bioavailability so there's yeah there's there's factors um in terms of what it's fortified with that are mm-hmm. um important and then yeah like you said it's it's luckily from the fermented food aspect of this it's certainly possible to get any range of fermented foods Mm -hmm. that are non-dairy in the diet whether that's sauerkraut or kimchi or or other fermented foods that are all kind of um you know plant plant plant-based yeah and that's that point about different types of or forms of nutrients being absorbed differently that's also something that i think should be well researched and potentially standardized because you do see a lot of different forms being used in the food system and then perhaps it depends on on the food that you're working with. But um, I certainly think formulators should be considering absorption rates. Yeah, yeah, um, If we change gears a little bit here, um, I'm wondering, have you looked at any of the research on dairy and acne? Uh, 
I, I know that there are a few studies or observational studies that suggest a link here. I'm wondering if that's something that you've kind of done. Um, yeah, I, d- I did. Um, actually, for like, uh, a, uh, I was basically presenting or asked to present at a skin conference a number of years ago um before way before code back in 2019 actually on uh, just nutritional factors in in skin um kind of health and influence and, and this is obviously kind of one of these um it's uh yeah yeah it's 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 a really messy area i think i think overall like top line is the actual research in this area is really poor quality overall um lots of kind of little case reports and anecdotes um and i've spoken at length actually about this with a friend of mine here who's a clinical dermatologist and sees this a lot and so drawing out cause effect type relationships really isn't possible with the with the data that's there like i said a lot of it is either observational or you know case reports in 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 a handful of Mm -hmm. people um Anecdotally, from speaking to people in Durham, there does appear to be a certain type of uh, person, um, often adolescent males who are chugging, you know, way on top of <laughs> on top of all of their dairy intake and milk, who do see a an improvement um, in their acne with like a reduction in or maybe even elimination of just the kind of like excess powder consumption um protein powder consumption uh again that's anecdotal so i'm just kind of throwing that out there as the mm-hmm. caveat um you know people have said oh is it the igf1 is it otherwise it's kind of like well you know again there's there's not really that good data to support mm. that kind of like link between dairy and, and, and acne. But there are observations that are there. And I know that, you know, there, there, there is, I think in someone who certainly does have a very high, like say whey protein intake or, um, or, or total like milk intake in particular, that some people might, might have a benefit to you know removing or 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 eliminating um that kind of high level of intake particularly like i said kind of adolescent or like early kind of men in their like early 20s um but yeah but 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 this is you know a lot of this is just kind of well is there a harm in trying this if someone you know deal deals with acne um, as opposed to anything robust at the level of evidence, which it's really not. The the research on on skin and uh, generally speaking on nutritional exposures is really really poor quality evidence. There's one really uh, it's quite a small um, study, um, and it'd be interesting for you to to talk to your dermatologist friend about. It looked at a, a congenital condition. I think it's a Laron syndrome. Laron or Laron syndrome. I'm not sure if okay. you've come across it, but no. it's it's a genetic condition where people have IGF-1 deficiency. Right. And this is a small paper, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, they had this this group of people with this condition who were given exogenous IGF-1. Okay. And they noticed that there was an increased. Um, risk of acne in those who took above the recommended dosage of IGF-1, which right. then subsided when the dosage was reduced. Right. I thought that was interesting. It's a it's a very small study. I'll flick it your way yeah. um, to, yeah, to do, have a yeah. look at. That is that is interesting. And so like within a certain range, no effect, but once they're kind of over, and this is being provided like intravenously or like like an injection or... Right. Yeah. Uh, to my knowledge. Yeah. 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 I'll, 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 yeah. I'll definitely yeah, ask about it. Um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I think anything that could add to that evidence base, like it's really poor quality. And often they're really like weird proxy outcomes. And they're often very subjective outcomes as well. So, like, even in the case reports, it's like someone being like, yeah, I looked at their skin. It looked better. <laughs> you know, yeah. It looked like they had less acne after getting rid of the dairy. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's very poor quality evidence, but yeah, again, like I said, anecdotally, it does appear that there is a, a kind of a phenotype of, of, of person that might benefit to that reduction or elimination. 
particularly if they're going really hard on whey protein powders. Okay, we're coming towards the end here, but we can't we can't finish this one without talking about dairy and bone health. Yeah. The the dairy industry has definitely been telling us for years that dairy is a great source of calcium, which it is, and really important for building strong bones. Is this is this just good marketing or is it supported uh, by data? It's it's a combination. Right. It's, it's certainly obviously blown to the maximum it possibly can be by the industry, by the marketing side. But, you know, for, from a bone health perspective, it's really not just the calcium and isolation that makes dairy interesting. It's rich in phosphorus and zinc. Um, vitamin D is often fortified in a lot of different countries as well. Um, and then there's dietary protein content, which we know from some of Best Dawson Hughes's research, there's like an interaction between dietary protein and calcium on things like bone mineral density. Um, it may relate as well to baseline calcium intake. If you see a significant increase in bone mineral content, that's often more robust in participants where their baseline calcium intake is low. And so does that mean that it's dairy foods necessarily, or does it just mean that they're a really good source of calcium and it's the bump up of calcium that's giving you this beneficial effect? And again, could that be achieved with a soy milk, for example? Like these are somewhat open questions right now. The epidemiology, uh, again, is, is relatively mixed and it depends a lot on background uh, population characteristics um, and depends on the actual kind of outcome, whether it's like, you know, a hip fracture risk or the, or just overall fracture risk. Um, so the, uh, and then there's also a, a potential life stage mediating effect. So there's the potential that actually there's a protective effect, you know, kind of, um, that accrues during adolescence and that you potentially don't see that specifically in adulthood, particularly for milk intake. Um, again, there, there has been analyses that have stratified further and yogurt and cheese pop up again as beneficial and associated with lower hip fracture risk. Um, but I, th I think perhaps the most, um, perhaps the most um, interesting uh, kind of recent finding in relation to this actually comes from a, a, a pretty large intervention that was um, conducted in Australia. And, and this was a really, really uh, like well-designed study at a number of issues that are specific to nutrition research. Um, for example, often interventions are conducted in people who have already, you know, sufficient in levels of intake of a given nutrient. This was, this was a, um, a randomized control trial in, but where it was a cluster randomized trial. So with a cluster randomized trial, you're randomizing not the individual, but uh, things like a center or a school. They're often used in education research. It's like, oh, we'll randomize this classroom to do this thing. And that classroom is the control. So this was in residential care homes. And there was 30 care homes in the intervention and 30 in the control. And they deliberately had an inclusion criteria of care homes that weren't serving more than two servings of dairy a day. So they were aiming for people to have a low calcium intake of less than 600 milligrams, give or take. And what they were mm -hmm. targeting was getting people up to around 13 milligram, 1300 milligrams of calcium and a gram of protein per kilo of body weight. And that increase coming from additional dairy foods. And they were specifically given 250 mils of milk, 200 grams of yogurt, or 40 grams of cheese. And the aim was to use these foods to bump up and achieve these calcium targets um, and, and protein targets. And there was like three, over 3,000 people in the intervention group and, and 3,000 in the control. Um, and, and nearly 70% of participants overall were female, which is also a positive given their higher overall risk of like osteoporosis and fractures. Um, and they didn't quite achieve the calcium target, but they basically got to 1,100 milligrams a day, which in an elderly population is really impressive. Mm -hmm. And they did hit the protein target. They got them to 1.1 grams a day. Um, 
And the difference in fracture rates was enormous. There was 121 fractures in the intervention group, 203 in the control group. So that was a relative risk reduction of like 33%, um, which was greater for hip fracture risk. It was 46% Mm. for hip fracture risk. Um, And the lines of like incidents started to diverge after five months. So five months into the study, the intervention group were were, uh, showing a benefit. Um, and there was also like a lower risk of, of falls. So it was a really well-designed study. They also held vitamin D constant throughout the trial. So they had sufficient vitamin D levels, but insufficient protein and calcium. So vitamin D was held constant while protein and calcium was increased. So I think that allows us to say that the effect derived was not confounded by kind of changes in vitamin D status Mm -hmm. um, from the Mm -hmm. increase in the foods. Um, And, you know, this is a really interesting study because the previous intervention trials, uh, certainly on supplemental, just calcium and vitamin D, not dairy necessarily, have provided really mixed results. The fact that this was a food-based intervention, I think, is probably the strongest element overall of of its kind of design. Mm -hmm. Now, the question then becomes, uh, does this necessarily mean that, you know, dairy foods are, are, again, a necessity for this kind of outcome? Mm -hmm. The short answer is... We, we don't know because this study, and there isn't a study to date with this kind of design that has tested, hey, we're going to achieve this level of calcium and this level of protein in a population low in protein and calcium that are at risk of fractures. And we're going to compare achieving that with dairy foods versus achieving it with, say, like soy foods, for example, soy milk and tofu. Mm -hmm. I I think that would be a really cool study to do. Um, And then we'd really know whether there is a kind of food matrix effect of dairy in relation to bone uh, beyond just the actual nutrient compositions themselves. But certainly Mm -hmm. this study does really lend you know, strong support to the, the, and, 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 and kind of certainly helps to reconcile some previous evidence that, yeah, there is a benefit to these foods helping you achieve nutritional adequacy with really important bone health nutrients. Yeah, it's uh, impossible to kind of ignore that given how prevalent osteoporosis is and and how detrimental fractures can be late in life. Um, Mm -hmm. I certainly think um, that's even more of a reason for me to get on the phone and call Big Soy after this. That's it. You know what? You know, what's coming to mind though here is there's a paper, I think Walter Willett was one of the authors, if not the main author called Milk and Health, I think it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a review. Mm. Mm. Do you see that? I, I think, is this the one where they're saying that the actual calcium targets were like lower than we think? Or is this a different? Yeah, paper? I think they, they definitely cover that. But one of the things that I see um, many people talking about is that within that study, and this may come back to our earlier point about the difficulties of comparing um, foods consumed by different populations mm-hmm. with very different backgrounds. But one of the observations was that the countries who drink the most milk tend to have the, the, the most hip fractures. Sure. And I'm interested in in what you think of that and any ideas for what could explain this association because I think some people think that or see that and think, well, milk is causing these hip fractures. Yeah. So so it's it's it, it, uh, this is more of a kind of an ecological fallacy comparison. Um, yes, countries with high, Western countries in particular have higher rates of osteoporosis than, for example, historically East Asian countries or South Asian countries. That, that, that itself is changing though, right? So that historic association is no longer as robust a difference as you find. And if you look at incidence of fractures and hip fractures in Southeast Asian populations, South and East Asian populations, not Southeast Asian, um, then you're finding that the trends are catching up to the prevalence in uh, Western countries. And that might be mediated by a number of factors, aging demographics in terms of population, but also the nutrition transition and shifting to a more kind of Westernized dietary pattern overall. 
if you look at the populations that do consume milk while having high rates of osteoporosis, there are also populations where widespread vitamin D inadequacy, insufficiency, and deficiency is observed in that population. And again, you know, you can maybe have all the calcium in the world, but in the absence of adequate vitamin D, that might not necessarily just in isolation be sufficient. So there's a number of factors that go into those associations, but drawing Mm -hmm. the line between, you know, milk and dairy intake and and that, Mm -hmm. that fracture rate incidence is really not... Uh, it's it's falling very prey to ecological fallacy. Right. Yeah, I think that is a, a a takeaway that or a conclusion that most people can understand. And and particularly when you consider that building strong bones, although calcium is important, it is a team game. It, and as you say, things like vitamin D and B12 and protein, all of these other components of our diet are also very, very um, important. And, and, and mechanical resistance, right? Stimulation, like physical exercise. Right. I think, you know, I mm-hmm. think of, 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 of kind of, of, of um, importance, I guess, or interest to um, people following plant exclusive type diets is an analysis from the nurse's health study, which looked specifically at the, um, fracture risk relative to vegan diets versus the other kind of dietary patterns in the AHS2 Mm -hmm. cohort. And what they found was that while, yes, there was a significantly like 50, 55% higher risk of fracture rate in the vegan group, with calcium and vitamin D supplementation, that was no longer significant. So Mm -hmm. I I do think it highlights that it's, it's perhaps these nutrients that are quite important. And while, yes, dairy typically, particularly in countries mm. who fortify milk with vitamin D, will be a really good source of these foods, it speaks to me, obviously, that this is possible to achieve adequate levels of these nutrients of interest um, mm-hmm. following a diet that does not include dairy. So I think that would be the kind of take-home message mm-hmm. is just make sure you're really nailing your your calcium and vitamin D intake. In addition to those things that you listed, it also seems important where possible to maintain a healthy body weight and to, to try and avoid being underweight when it comes to risk of, of fractures. Yes. Um, and that is obviously is something that within the epidemiology you would uh, observe typically is... Uh, people following certainly within the limited data we have from the cohorts where people are vegan, uh, like the AHS2 um, or some of the European uh, EPIC sub cohorts, is like lower body weight. Um, and there's that we would typically say, hey, that's a healthy thing. But actually, there's a, there's more of a prevalence of people with like a BMI of under 18. So it is something I think to bear in mind is that people are you know, if they're following a, certainly a plant exclusive diet is like nailing their protein intake and overall energy intake and maintaining that mm-hmm. level of adequacy because certainly protein and calcium appear to have a really beneficial interaction effect on bone health. Right. Um, and you mentioned the importance of resistance exercise. I had Stuart Phillips on the show a little while ago. Mm. And one thing that I'm really looking forward to to seeing more research on is looking at, I mean, we know that resistance exercise is such an important stimulus to both for bone, but also for muscle and sarcopenia. We haven't spoken about that, but that's also a big um, issue which can affect frailty and and falls and um, influence fractures. And it'll be interesting to see if some studies come out, hopefully they do, looking at the difference between animal proteins and plant proteins in the elderly population where anabolic resistance um, has, you know, set in at varying levels. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it would be, I think there's, there is some interesting research on the kind of the anabolic resistance side, the potential of proteins and, and even uh, this is where there's interest in dairy proteins, right? Is potentially like having that kind of, that anabolic effect that potentially is important in overcoming some degree of age-related anabolic resistance um, and sarcopenia. Um, And is this, again, something that is a unique property of things like, I don't know, whey protein or casein, or is it something that can be achieved with with absolute protein intake? And, And I think a lot of the evidence that we have on this question 
would likely overall point to you know, the, the potential to achieve a degree of parity, but like obviously factors like leucine content mm-hmm. and otherwise need to be need to be factored in. And again, it just so happens that dairy foods are typically foods at which it's very easy to get a mm-hmm. uh, a, a lot of, you know, essential amino acids and, and leucine in particular at relatively lower dose, total doses of the food intake. Mate, this has been super interesting. Is there anything that you think we missed that you perhaps wanted to add before we wrap things up? Yeah, so I think it's important to hold these separate conversations in tension that we can have an objective assessment of the scientific research and the outcomes related to a food without that having an implication for how we would then consider that food or food group from an environmental or welfare standpoint. Um, And just because... There is potentially, uh, as we know, a negative contribution, so to speak, to a food group like dairy in terms of its production for, say, greenhouse gas emissions. That doesn't mean that the interpretation of the research on its health effects necessarily has to be negative as well. Um, And I think that people are really blurring the lines between those two, and there's just no need for us to do that. Mm -hmm. And so as a bit of a kind of summary here, if you want to bring us home... Uh, it's been two and a half hours, so I'm sure that that some folks are probably thinking, Alan, just tell me what to do. Um, if, if someone is not including dairy in their diet, what should they be conscious of with regards to replacements? And if someone is consuming dairy, what types and, and how much per day roughly would you recommend? Yeah, I think if someone's not consuming dairy at all, then I think that, you know, protein, calcium, vitamin D, and then potentially things like phosphorus. I doubt that's going to be an issue on a plant-exclusive diet. But protein, Mm -hmm. calcium, and vitamin D would be where you'd really want to be making up and making sure that there is nutritional adequacy in the diet. And again, that can be easily achieved with things like soy milk and other soy food produce and obviously supplemental vitamin D and otherwise. So it's not a shortfall that is particularly difficult to overcome, but it is one that does require some consideration in terms of the diet. Mm -hmm. And then for someone that does consume dairy, I think if we really parse the research overall, where we're seeing a benefit is with dairy produce that is primarily of the fermented variety, whether that's yogurt, cheese, and indeed kefir, which is kind of a halfway house between yogurt and milk. Um, Milk seems like kind of neutral overall, but depending on someone's health status and background, um, background total dairy intake and saturated fat content, they might want to think about maybe adopting a lower fat dairy um, particularly if they did consume other animal forms of saturated fat. But I think overall we could say that the contribution of foods like fermented yogurts, dairy, uh, and things like kefir in population diets that have lower overall background saturated fat intake and wider healthful characteristics um, uh, is, is, is something that is not nece- going to be a concern Uh, for their health and indeed may benefit across a range of outcomes. Okay, great. Um, Remind folks where they can catch you online if they'd like to hear more from you or to explore the the deep dives that you do. Yeah, so on Instagram, you'll find me at the nutritional underscore advocate. It's the only social media account (laughs) that I have the sanity (laughs) to operate. And then you'll find me at alineanutrition.com, which is my research review based uh, education hub and website. And also with Danny Lennon at Sigma Nutrition um, with our podcast episodes and uh, written statements. Wonderful. And there's there's an episode there on Sigma with Mario Kratz. So for those who are wanting more sort of information or specifics on his particular studies with regards to to dairy and some of those things we spoke about, I highly recommend that episode. Thanks, Alan. Always a pleasure. Uh, Look forward to doing this again sometime soon. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format.
yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.